Alright, Skeleton 311 back, and this will be our last video for the tutorial of Liberty or Death, and we moved into the Winter's Quarters phase here, which acts as the end of um, a section of the game. Um, yeah, so, anyway, sorry. So first thing we do is we check victory conditions. It says here on the bottom, victory, 7.2, execute winter quarter round. So the victory conditions we're checking. So first we double check, let's double check where we're at on the markers here. Support is at 3 for the British. And opposition is at 5 for the rebels. Um, cumulative British casualties are at 4. Cumulative rebellion at 7. And there are three Patriot Forts. You don't really have to look around the map, I don't believe, because you can just look and see what's missing. So there's three there's three Patriot Forts on the map, because they can have six total, there's three here. So I, I believe that would be the quickest way to do it. And three Indian villages on the map, because they can have ten, and there's three missing. So there's three Indian villages. And the French have played the Treaty of Alliance card, which is actually one of their um, victory conditions. So those are what is going on. So British, if you remember, the British needs um, opposition, actually, the British needs support to exceed opposition by more than 10. And right now there's a difference of uh, minus 2. So that is not um, passed. But the um, rebellion casualties are at 7, and the British are at 4. So... That they've actually completed. So for the British to win, they have to have support more than opposition uh, by 10, more than 10, and they need to have less casualties. So they have less casualties, but they don't have more support. So they have one of their two victory conditions, so they don't have enough to get a victory. Patriots is the opposite. They need opposition to exceed support by more than 10, which is not. It's only two right now. And Patriot Forts plus three is greater than Villages. So there's Patriot Forts, there's three on the board, plus three is six. And that has to be greater than the Villages, which is three, which it is. But they have, so they have one of their two victory conditions, but not both. French, opposition needs to be more than ten of support, which it's not, it's two. And British casualties is not greater than Rebellion casualties. So they need the British to be more than rebellion, which it's not. So they actually have both failed right now. They're not. They don't have either one where they need it. But they have played the Treaty of Alliance card, which is one thing they had to do. And then the Indians, again, support for them has to exceed opposition, and it's minus two by more than ten, so it's not. And the villages less than three is not greater than forts. So they actually have to take the villages less than three. So they have three villages minus three is zero. That has to be greater than the forts, which of course it's not, 0 to 3. So they've failed on both as of now as well. So no faction has achieved uh, victory, so there's no winner, and we move on to the supply phase. So each faction must check to see if any other pieces must be supplied or treated alternately. So we'll start with the British. Um, there were a few spaces with British cubes, but no British fort that aren't cities with British control. So that's the trigger there. Are there British cubes on the map that are um, not in space with a British fort that are not in cities with British control? And there are. New York Colony. Um, let's see. New York Colony is up here. Right, sorry about that. So, are there um, British cubes with, but no British forts that aren't cities with British control? So that's kind of an interesting thing there. Okay, I get. All right, now I know why I was confused. Okay, so it says British um, cubes are in supply if they are in a space with a British fort or in a city with British control. So it's a city with British control. If they're not, it's not a city. They have to have a fort there. 
If not, the British must pay one resource to keep them there, remove cubes to available, or shift one space level toward active opposition. If no shift possible and no resource paid, remove to available. Okay, so I was wondering what's going on here with, uh, with that when it comes to New York. Because this is New York Colony, not New York City. So it's not a city, so they have to have a fort here. That's the problem. They don't have a fort because it's not a city. So either they pay a resource, which they only have two, and they don't want to pay those. They want to save those for later. Um, they remove cubes to available, which they don't want to remove cubes from there either. So what they're going to choose to do is um, shift... Uh, The space from passive support to neutral. So they're passive support, so they're going to take that off and become neutral, and they'll keep their units there. Now, because of that, it's a two population city, they lose two um, total support because they lost two there. So their total support actually drops down from three to one because of that. You take the population times one if it's passive and it's not there, they lost it, so they lose those points. Um, okay, so. Holding resources and not willing to shift any other spaces toward opposition, the British will return the pieces in Virginia and South Carolina to available. The British now lose control of Virginia. Alright, so, if you look at Virginia, here, they have two Tories here. It's a colony, so they need a fort, they don't have one. So again, they would either have to pay resource, they can't shift the opposition because it's neutral. Or they have to remove the cubes, so they're going to choose to remove the cubes, actually. And Virginia um, lose control of Virginia now, so it goes away. It's uncontrolled. And South Carolina here is actually in rebellion control. And they have two cubes here, so again, they're just going to return these pieces away, so they don't have to do spend any resources. Alright, so that is done for the British. The Patriots, there is one space with militia or continentals that is either an Indian reserve without a fort, or a colony or city without a Patriot fort and without rebellion control. And that is the Quebec province, which is up to the north here. So if we take a look at what matters for Patriots, Patriot militia and continentals are in supply if they are in a space with a Patriot fort, or a colony or city with rebellion control. If not, they may either pay one resource per space or remove one for every two total Patriot units there, rounding down to available. One for every two total Patriot units there. Okay. So, in Quebec, it's British controlled, and there's no fort. Um, well, the Indian Reserve without a fort or Patriot fort or a colony or city without a Patriot fort and without rebellion control. So uh, they could pay one resource to remove one unit or remove one unit for every two total units there. Um, since the removal of one for two is rounded down and there's only one militia, the Patriots choose that option and remove no pieces from Quebec province. So they don't have to remove that piece because it's one, they remove one for every two, but they only have one there rounded down. So they get to keep them there, actually. So the French are only in this one space, and it is rebellion controlled, and they are in South Carolina. If you remember that move that we did uh, last turn, they're here in South Carolina. It's rebellion controlled. So there's no space with French regulars without a Patriot fort or without rebellion control. So they take no action. And the Indians, since there are already villages on the map, the Indians are concerned with any colony with war parties and no village. In this case, North Carolina and New York Colony. The Indians must pay one resource to stay in each colony, but only have one resource currently, so they will move the war parties to the nearest village. The two war parties in New York moved to Quebec province, accompanied by Brant. Okay. So they're in New York province, they move toward the Quebec province, Company by Brandt. So they move with Brandt to the Quebec province, which actually wraps all the way around so they can go north here. 
So basically in the Quebec province with Brant. They move over because they can get to the north from New York. This is all Quebec province up here. So they move over here with Brant. And the war party in North Carolina will move to the southwest. So there's a war party here in North Carolina. And they'll move to the west here. To the southwest. And the reason they're doing that is for the Indians. If no villages are on the map, there are villages. Indians place one village in any one Indian reserve province. Indian war parties are in supply if they're in a space... Um, with a village. Indian war parties are in supply if they are in a space with a village or in an Indian reserve province. If not, which those weren't, the Indians may either pay one resource or move the war parties to the nearest province with a village. So it's just the nearest province with a village. Okay. So because of that, they moved. They didn't want to spend the resource. They only have one resource. They want to keep it. So they just moved off the map. Southwest Quebec. Okay. So that's the Indians total supply. So now, West Indy battle. We're actually going to have a battle here in the West Indies. The French must conduct a free battle since French and British pieces are in the West Indies holding box. Since they're both here, a battle occurs. The French are the attacker because they initiated the battle. Force levels are calculated first. Um, the French make decisions for the rebellion during the battle, but note that only French regulars are allowed in the West Indies, so that's pretty much irrelevant for this. Um, so the French attack is three, the British is three for their level. One for each regular in the space. And uh, there are three British regulars each, which adds one to the force level for a total force level of three. Now both sides, force levels have been calculated. It's time to determine the side's loss level. Each side must determine how many three-sided dice are to be rolled. So you take the force level and divide that by three. Um, so that each of them get one three-sided die. If you remember how the battles work, you count up the units, so it's 3-3, three, three. then you divide them by 3, so one die for the British, one die for the French. Um, the British roll a 2, and the French both, so they both roll a 2. Let's see if I can both roll 2s. No, I both roll 3s, okay. <laughs> So they both roll a 2, according to the tutorial here. Um, preliminary loss levels are now modified for the modifiers. So the modifiers that are used for this battle, uh, we'll just go through it quickly here. Um, the French roll is modified by plus 1 because half or more of their force is composed of regulars. These are just regular units. More than half, so that's a plus 1. Um for a total modifier of plus one. This brings the defender final loss level up by one, two, three. They roll a two, plus one is a three. So we'll just change that for modifying it. The British roll is modified by plus one because half or more of their force is composed of regulars, which it is, so they go to three. But minus one, since the British are defending in the West Indies and at least one squadron is present, which it is, you're a French squadron. So they got one for being more than half regulars, but then they lose it because of the squadron. So they have um, a two, basically. So the French remove one regular, since regulars and force count as two losses. So they do two damage. One regular is removed. Three damage to the French, or to the British. Um, so two losses. There's still a loss left. So this guy's worth two, but they still have to pay for the one, so he gets removed as well. So they both get taken off. Um, the French is the winner, losing only one piece compared to two pieces removed for the British. There will be no win the day since the battle is in the West Indies, which is always neutral. So win the day happens if you're in a non-neutral um, area, depending on who won. So the West Indies is always neutral. So that doesn't happen. All cubes and forts lost go to casualties. So the British casualties increase from four to six because they lost two. So their casualties move from four to six. And um, 
combine rebellion casualties from seven to eight, because the rebellion French is part of the rebellion now. So seven to eight. French prep is not increased further because the French have played the Treaty of Alliance card and end the war. No resources are paid as it is during the West Indies' free battle phase. You don't have to pay a resource to fight, but this is part of the battle phase. It's a free phase during the winter quarters section. So now that the French are at war, they don't, you don't put these up when there's losses or anything. It just stays where it's at, 21. Um, all right. So according to, to uh, the rules, 622, and only in the West Indies, the French, then British, may remove friendly remaining units in the West Indies to available or pay one resource. The French pay one resource to leave the two units there, which puts them down from three to two. Um, and the British will remove one and put it to available. They don't want to pay a resource that, for one guy that's sitting in the West Indies there. So they take that away. And that is the end of supply. So now we move on to the resource phase. Each faction adds resources as follows. British add resources equal to the number of British forts on the map. So if you look at their forts, they can have six total. So there's three on the map, three missing. Plus the population of cities under British control, but not blockaded. So they have control of New York, and they have control of Philadelphia, but they're both blockaded, so they don't add those points. The only city they have control of that's not blockaded is Quebec City, way on the top of the map up there. So the population of Quebec City is one. So they get um, three for the forts, and one for Quebec City. And plus five if the British control West Indies, which they don't. So they get three for the forts, one for the city, so they get four additional resources. And that's it. So the British resources move from two to six. Okay. So now we do the Indians add resources equal to half the number of villages on the map rounded down. They have three divided by two is one and a half rounded down to one. Indian resources now total two. That's how they get the. Re that's it. Number of villages. So they go up one, two. Patriots add resources equal to patriot forts on the map. They have three. Plus half the number of spaces under rebellion control. So rebellion control. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven spaces under rebellion control. Divided by two is three and a half. Rounded down to three. So that's six. Three for the forts, three for the spaces in rebellion control. So they move up from six to twelve resources. It's a big jump for them. And the French add resources equal to their French naval intervention level, which is two, plus population of cities not under British control, it includes the cities of Savannah, Charlestown, Norfolk, and Boston. So the cities that are not under British control, Boston is not, so that's one. City of Norfolk, one, so that's two. City of Charleston, Charlestown, one, so that's three. City of Savannah, not under British control, so that's four, plus the two is six. And then uh, two, four, that's six, then plus five if Rebellion controls West Indies, which they do. So, level 2, plus population, so under British control, 4, so it's 6, and plus 5 if they control West Indies, which they do, so that's 6 plus 5 is 11, so they get 11 additional resources, so that's a crap ton. So they, have thir they go from 12 to 13 resources, wow, that really jumps up. So having control of the West Indies gives them plus 5, um, any city that does not have British control gives them plus 1, and then they're... Dominance, too, and that adds up pretty good. That's 11. They, they far got the most resources of any faction during that resource phase. Okay, so the British then, the Patriots, may spend resources to affect support and opposition. The game ends if this is the final winter quarters round. Okay. 
Reward loyalty. The British may spend resources to build support in British-controlled spaces with one or more British regular and one or more Tories. They may spend one resource to remove each raid or propaganda marker from the space, and then, once no more exist, may spend one resource per shift to move toward active support. There's a maximum of two shifts per space during this phase as opposed to during the British Muster Command, when only one space can be shifted with no limit. Quebec City and New York Colony meet the requirements for reward loyalty. So, Quebec City and New York. And remember, the uh, British controlled spaces with one or more British regular and Tory. So, the only ones they have is New York Colony. They have British, they have control, and one of the, at least one of each in Quebec City. Up on the top of the map there, up there, they have one of each, and it's British controlled. Uh, Quebec is not eligible, and is it an Indian Reserve province? This always stays at neutral, okay? And why is there a British control there? Or why is the opposition there? Is that a mistake? I, I, mean, I must have made a mistake. I don't understand that. Okay. Um, oh, no, no, not Quebec City. I'm sorry. Quebec itself. I'm sorry. Confused. So they actually would have done it here. They have one of each, and they're in control of it. But since Quebec is always neutral, that's not one of the, the spaces that could happen. Not Quebec City. Okay. I apologize. Um, in New York County, the British will pay one resource to change the space one level from passive support to active support. All right. So they're going to pay one of their resources to change um, one level from passive support to active support. They will spend one more resource to shift Quebec City from passive to active. Opposition is unchanged and support goes up three from one to four. British resources drops from three from six to three. I must have accidentally taken off this neutral at one point because this is supposed to be passive here on New York Colony so I must have made that mistake at one point. Um, so they're going to Pay one resource to change uh, that from passive to active. So they'll flip that over, and then they'll do the same for the one in Quebec City. Pay one resource to change that from passive to active. Opposition is unchanged, and the support goes up. So that is population of 2 times 2 is 4. 1 times 2 is 2, so that's 6. So support goes up 6. Um, and British resources drop from 3, from 6 to 3. Okay. I must have put, I must have screwed up somewhere in there because it's not quite exactly how it's at telling me to do it. So I must have accidentally placed... Some of these oppositions in the wrong spot um, in the beginning, so that kind of blows, but all right. All right, committees of correspondence. Now the Patriots are up for their opposite action. Committees of correspondence. In any rebellion-controlled space with a Patriot piece, the Patriots may spend one resource to remove each raid marker. Their own propaganda markers don't impact them. And then, once no more raid markers remain in the space, they may spend one resource per shift to move the space toward active opposition. There's a maximum of only two shifts per space during this phase. Eligible spaces include Boston. They have control of Boston up there. So it's only rebellion control space with the Patriot piece. So they have one in Boston. They have one here in Charlestown. Rebellion control with the piece. Connecticut, Rhode Island. Rebellion control with the piece. North Carolina. Rebellion control with the piece. South Carolina, rebellion control with pieces, and Georgia, rebellion control with pieces. So they have uh, six possible spots. Massachusetts would qualify, except that it's already at active opposition, so no ships are possible. So there's one other place, but it's already maxed out. The Patriots will spend one resource to shift Boston from passive to active. Alright, so they'll spend one to shift Boston from passive to active. Okay, they're going to um, 
and two each to ship Charlestown, Connecticut, and South Carolina from neutral to active. Two each. So that's six more. So one, two, three, four, five. That's what dropping down to five. So they're going to start in Charlestown from neutral to active. So Charlestown goes from neutral to active. Um, Connecticut goes from neutral to active. And South Carolina goes from neutral to active right here. Okay. Um, with one to remove, okay. So, with just one raid marker in North Carolina, right here, Patriots will spend one to remove it, and then two more to move the space to active opposition. So it takes one to get rid of the raid marker, and then they're going to spend another two, so that's three more, put them down to two resources to get active opposition in North Carolina, and one to remove the raid marker. Total opposition increases 15 from 5 to 20, which is crazy. So we had to add all these up. So Connecticut is 2 times... So 2 times 2 is 4. Um, Boston, 1 times 2 is 2, so that's 6. Charlestown, 1 times 2 is 2, so that's 8. South Carolina, 2 times 2 is 4, so that's 12. North Carolina, 2 times 2 is 4. So that's 16. Is that wrong? I think that's wrong because it's saying it's supposed to be 15. In total, the Patriots spent 10 resources, dropping the total from 12 to 2. All right, I got that right. Uh, total opposition increases 15 from 5 to 20. All right, so where do we go here? We did Boston, passive to active, 2. Uh... Charlestown and Connecticut, and South Carolina from neutral to active. So Charlestown is 2, so that's 4. South Carolina is 4, so that's 8. And Connecticut is 4, so that's 12. Okay. Uh, the Patriots spend it, and then they move the North Carolina to active active opposition. So it's just four. So that's sixteen. I'm doing something wrong with my the way I'm figuring this out. Huh. The only thing I can think I'm doing wrong is because Boston was passive first, they don't go times two, they don't go times one. Because they were times one and then they move it to times two. So instead of gaining two times with the one, they just do the one times the one for the one change to give them one. So that would be one, five, seven, eleven, fifteen. So I think that's what it is. Maybe I, that's my fault. When you go from passive to active, you must only go times one. You don't go the full times two because it was already at times one. That could be the only thing I could think of. That will add it to 15, so that could be how it works on that side. Okay. So, 15, they move from 5 to 20 on the total opposition. So, that's a huge jump, and they are actually over 10 more than the British. The problem is they have more casualties than the British, so they actually... Could be, could be like have both the victory conditions if their casualties were less than the British. But I think we check for victory at the beginning of the winter quarters, not at the end. So after all these big changes happen, doesn't mean you're going to win right now. Um, you have to do it at the beginning. So, but they got a big lead. So if this were the final winter quarters card of a scenario, we would end the game right here and calculate victory. But this scenario still has three winter quarter cards remaining, so play will continue. Okay. So then we do redeployment phase. The first step is to check for a leader change. Look at the next event card, in this case Antoine de Sartine. So even though this winner's card replaced it, 
it's telling us to look at the next one, the one I replaced. So it's French, Patriot, Indian, British. Uh, the factions icon appears first. We'll check for leader change, French. Each faction has an order list of leaders shown who will replace whom. The French are first on Antoine de Sartini's card, Secretary of the Navy. They cannot have a leader change before they're in war, but since they play their alliance, they are in war. So we look at the French leader order. So there's a card that shows that, and it's also in the book. So I'll just show you the card for French leaders, or leaders. And they also have capabilities, too that happen. We haven't really looked at this because we haven't brought it up, but they have their names, faction, and capabilities. And these arrows mean that there's a change. So Washington is always the leader of the Patriots. The French, you see they have Rochambeau, and they could change here to Lausanne. And then Gage could change to Howe for the British, could change to Clinton and the Indians. Uh, Brant could change to Corn Planner, who can change to Dragon Canoe. So because the French have are first on the card, they actually have to change leaders if there's a change left. So Rochambeau is on the board, so he is replaced with Lausen. Lausen replaces Rochambeau in South Carolina, and Rochambeau is removed from the game. Since the French do not have another leader on the schedule, they will not make another leader change if their icon comes up la later. Lausen will be the French leader for the remainder of the game. With a plus one to defender loss level in battle, including the French attacking in the space, allows him to prove very useful. We're saying that his ability here, additional plus one to defender loss level when French attacking in the space. So he's good at attacking, helping their attack. So we got to find Rochambeau, who is in South Carolina. And he is removed from the game and replaced with... Um, Loudon, where I don't know if I have Loudon on the map actually here, or do I? I thought I had everything out. I must not. I do have his large piece. Oh, actually, it might be on the other side. It is. It is. So it's Rochambeau, and you flip it over, and there's Loudon. So you, you basically just flip it over, and Loudon is now the general or leader. Okay, um, each faction may move its leader to another space with the same faction's pieces. The Indians decide first. And that will go from... Well, it doesn't go from the card. I guess it says the Indians decide first. They choose to move Brant from Quebec to Southwest because Southwest has more war parties and more villages. All right. So Brant moves from Quebec to the Southwest province. Um, now the French are up. They cannot move Lausanne because he's in the only space on the map with French pieces. Although the French could move him back to available. The British choose third. They will move, choose to move Howe from Philadelphia to New York Colony, where there's a greater chance of a battle. So he's going to go from Philadelphia to New York Colony. Greater chance of battle because Massachusetts is built up right next door. And the Patriots are up last. They'll leave Washington to Massachusetts. At this point, the British received more pieces in the available box according to the scenario instructions. In the 1776 scenario, which we are currently looking at, the British received six regulars and six Tories during the first winter quarter round. Of the six unavailable British regulars, three were moved from unavailable during the campaign, so only three British regulars and six Tories will be moving from unavailable to available. Move those pieces from unavailable to available now. The British no longer have pieces that are unavailable. So six and six, but that we used three earlier. So we can move six Tories over and three unavailables over. And they get no more unavailable pieces the rest of the game. Finally, um, the uh, French naval intervention is reduced from two to one, and the British must choose which blockade to remove. So this goes down, and the British get to choose a blockade to remove. The British choose to remove the blockade in Philadelphia to the West Indies, leaving New York blockaded. The French can change the location of the blockade from New York to another city, but chooses not to. So they move Philadelphia back to the French squadron here. Um, 
So Philadelphia is no longer blockaded. Um, the French can change the location of the blockade from New York to another city, but they're going to leave it in New York. Okay, so now we do the desertion phase. Patriot desertion is first. Remove one in five continentals and one in five militia on the map, round and down. Interesting. The Patriots have seven continentals and twelve militia, so one in five. So one continental and two militia will be removed. The Indians choose the first continental and first militia removed. Interesting. Uh, when applicable. And the Patriots choose the rest. Right now the Indians decide to remove the militia in Boston to available. Boston is now uncontrolled. So Boston to available. Boston is uncontrolled because there's no units there. Okay. And um, the Continental in North Carolina to available because it threatens their villages. So the Continental in North Carolina comes off because it's right near their villages there. Okay. Um, the Patriots must remove one militia and choose to remove one from Massachusetts to available. So there was three. There was two that they had to do for militia, so they're going to take one from Massachusetts and remove them for the total of three that they had to get rid of. Um, now Tory desertion is resolved. A fifth of the Tories on the map are removed, running down. The British currently have five Tories, so one Tory will be removed. The French choose the first Tory to remove, and the British choose the rest. Right now the French decide to remove a Tory from New York Colony because it's closest to the main rebellion force. So the French would choose their New York Colony. There we go. And that is done. Okay, so that's desertion. So only the Patriots and Tory desert. That's interesting. Okay. Then the reset phase. Remove all raid and propaganda markers from the map. Okay, so there's propaganda markers in Massachusetts that are over here in the overflow box so they come off the map. There's no more raid markers on the map and that's it for that. Okay. Move all factions to eligible. Okay. And move cubes in the casualties box back to the respective available forces boxes. Well, that's interesting. So all cubes in the casualties back to the respective available forces boxes. Okay. So there's four regulars here for the British who go back, one Tory, there's one French regular, and four Continentals for the Patriots. Those all go back to their available forces. Flip all militia and war parties underground. Okay, so the two war parties in the southwest flip. The militia in Philadelphia flips. And it looks like that's all that's on the map. And move the next card, in this case Antoine de Sardine, Secretary of the Navy, to the played event pile. And flip up a new card as the cup come in event. So the winner quarters goes away, I guess, and the card that it flipped, landed on stays. That's what it seems like. And so there is actually no card to flip because we're at the end here. Because the Sony came up to this phase, the uh, tutorial. The last step is to resolve the event on the Winter Quarters card. Each Winter Quarters card is a different event. This particular Winter Quarters card deducts two resources from whichever faction between the Indians and Patriots are ahead on their secondary victory condition. So let's see. Flood shift the balance. If Patriots or Indians are ahead in their second victory condition, that faction loses two resources during a reset phase. The second victory condition is the forts to the um, villages, I believe. Um, on the board, the number of three is displayed under Patriot Forts, indicating the number of Patriot Forts on the map. The number of three is displayed under Indian Villages, indicating the number of villages on the map. That's up here. There's three forts and three villages on the map. First, determine the victory margin of the second victory condition for the Patriots and Indians. For the Indians, reduce Indian Villages by three, which makes it zero, to compare to Patriot Forts. Give the Indians a victory margin of minus three. For the Indians' second... Um, victory condition. For the Patriots, Patriot Forts 3 plus 3, 6, are compared to Indian Villages, given the Patriots a victory margin of 3 for the Patriots' second victory military condition. 
Um, the Patriots are in the lead for the second victory condition and thus lose two resources, reducing them from two to zero. Okay. Um, note that resources cannot be lower than zero and that any resources not reduced are not carried over. Winter the quarter round is now complete. And that is it. Congratulations on completing your first campaign of Liberty or Death. Shuffle up some more cards to continue from this board position or start a new game. We hope you enjoy Liberty or Death and get a new perspective on one of the most important wars of modern history. So, that is the tutorial. And I'm going to reset everything and play an actual game myself now that I have some of the rules down. I'm still going to have to look at the book. I hope this helped anybody who was interested in this game. I know there were some pauses and me having to look up stuff up, but this was the first time I played as well. So hopefully... This could help anybody else um, who's interested in checking out the game or just wants to know more about it or anything. So I appreciate anybody who watched through this. Um, and it was a little bumpy here or there. But this game looks pretty interesting, and I can't wait to actually get a real game going here. So thanks again for uh, checking it out, and I'll see you guys later.